Um, good afternoon. Welcome to the National Civil War Museum. My name is Dane DeFebo. I'm the museum educator here. And I'd like to welcome you to today's program, which will focus on the women of Richmond, Virginia, Confederate capital. Our speaker for today's program is uh, Dr. Ashley Whitehead Buskey. She's the assistant director of the Civil War Institute at Gettysburg College, where she works closely with Gettysburg College's students on a variety of original research-based uh, projects related to the Civil War and public history. She coordinates the annual Civil War Institute Summer Fellows or Summer Conference and gives tours of the battlefields to visitors. Prior to her arrival at the Civil War Institute, um, she worked for 10 years with the National Park Service, and most recently an eight-year stint as a park ranger and historian at the Richmond National Battlefield Park, where she helped co-organize and lead numerous special events for the Civil War sesquicentennial. She is currently revising her dissertation manuscript, which is a cultural study of the wives and daughters of the Confederate Richmond's leading generals, politicians, businessmen, and she is seeking publication for her dissertation as well. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lusky, and uh, I'm looking forward to a wonderful program today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm hoping that even if I walk away from the mic for a little bit, you should be able to hear me considering uh, my time in the Park Service trained me well um, for having a ranger voice. Um, but first of all, I want to say thank you to uh, Wayne Motts and the entire National Civil War Museum uh, for having me here today. Um, I've actually never been to the National Civil War Museum, um, which is a little bit embarrassing. I just moved here last year, so we're obviously remedying that today. But I also want to thank you all uh, for coming out today. I know that there are a bunch of exciting Civil War related events going on this weekend uh, in this greater area, so I'm thankful to you all uh, for choosing to come to this talk, and some of you in period guard, no less. So uh, thank you. Um, as I've often remarked to uh, other audiences that I've given a talk to along these general lines, uh, pretty much anybody who knows me, who's been on a program with me, a tour with me, knows that this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Now, looking at the title of today's talk, you might say that's a little interesting that she's so fascinated by 19th century prostitutes. Um, in my defense, I'm also equally as interested in the elite, distinguished ladies of Richmond during the Civil War, so I feel like it all balances out in the end. Um, as Dane was saying, this, is, uh, this topic comes from a larger book project that I'm working on, so Literally, I could probably talk to you about this for hours. I'm pretty sure nobody wants that. Um, so I decided to just pick out a few highlights for you today to try to illuminate the, uh, the bigger themes that I'm getting at in that book project. Um, and those are basically to look at some of the key ways that Richmond's leading ladies sought to exercise their social and political power in the Confederate capital, uh, as well as some of the challenges and the realities they face as they're constantly being tested and constantly being threatened. Uh, their power is being threatened, that is, throughout the entire Civil War. Uh, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So, to start off, how many of you have been to Richmond before? Familiar with it? Okay, so a, a pretty good number of you, that's good. So I'm going to be making some general uh, remarks um, about a few specific areas in Richmond, so some of you might be able to, to better relate to that. Um, as many of you might know, Richmond, because it becomes the Confederate capital in May of 1861, it experiences remarkable transformation throughout the Civil War. Now, it starts out with a population of 38,000 individuals. By the end of the Civil War, that population is going to mushroom, just explode, into 150,000 people. Wow, I was right. Now, of course, who are some of these people who are coming into the city? We have a diverse range of individuals. Because it is the Confederate capital, we're talking about new war industries that are moving into the city. We have, of course, iron, munitions factories. We have wool factories, factories that make sh uh, shoes and all kinds of clothes, clothes for the Confederate army. We have government offices that are attracting the individuals who need to staff them. We have other war workers. We have refugees who are coming from all parts of the Deep South as the various armies move through the South and remove these people from their homes. We have, of course, the politicians, the people who are actually 
uh, running this war effort, we have their families. We have slaves. We have free African Americans. We also have speculators. We have businessmen. We have scam artists. We have soldiers. We have hospital workers. And then, of course, we have the quote-unquote fair ones from the world's oldest profession. Next slide. Now, uh, one of the social chroniclers of Richmond during the war, uh, who we'll talk about in just a minute, uh, wrote about the massive transformations to the population uh, in Richmond throughout the war. And he called it basically a social jambalaya. All of these people from all different regions, backgrounds, coming into R Richmond and mixing together for the very first time. And this creates massive shifts. Some of them for the good. Obviously, the economy explodes in many ways, the war economy. But in other ways, we have massive inflation going on, we have overcrowding, we have disease, um, we have rampant speculation, people trying to take advantage, of course, of all these new people coming into Richmond, of all of these new industries that are cropping up. And then, of course, we have the expected social tensions. Um, before the war, Richmond, although it was a major port city because of the rivers and its connections with railroads and all of that, um, it was economically diverse, but it was pretty socially parochial. And it had a very well-defined social order that Richmonders prided themselves on. And that social order was policed by certain mores and morals that separated kind of the people from the higher end of the population from the people who were regarded as kind of the lower end of society. It was also dictated by certain spatial boundaries in the city. And by that I mean that generally the uh, wealthier, the more educated, the more prominent members in Richmond society, they would live in the higher parts of town, the more elevated parts. Richmond, kind of like Rome, is a city of seven hills, um, and so those people would generally live on the top of the hills. In the bottom, the kind of the valleys, the swales of the city, that's where you'd find the poorer people, the immigrants, the African Americans, um, as well as some of these prostitutes that we'll be talking about. Um, you want to advance the slide. So with all of these newcomers coming into the city, they are blurring these social and spatial boundaries in a very unsettling and very threatening way to some of the city's longtime residents. And as I mentioned, there is an individual, this is him, his name is T.C. De Leon, who is a social chronicler of the city of Richmond during the war, and he wrote a very rich account of what it was like to be amongst basically the highest of the high society in Richmond. And he remarked about the massive transformation that the people of Richmond had to endure and how they responded to that. And he wrote in one particularly telling passage, quote, In the city, where class sometimes jostled privilege, the line of demarcation was so strongly drawn that overstepping was dangerous. So again, he's talking about that very specifically ordered social hierarchy. When the news came that patriotism dictated the abandonment of inland Montgomery, Alabama for border Richmond, again as the capital, a surprise that was not all pleasurable, thrilled to the fingertips of Richmond society. Its exponents felt much as the Roman patricians must have felt at the impending advent of the leading families of the Goths. So we're getting a little dramatic, but this is how some of those people thought. Her sacred fanes might possibly be desecrated by profane touch, her vestal virgins viewed by vulgar eyes. At first blush of the new invasion, it is assumable that older Richmond was ready to bolt the front door and lock the shutters. Younger Richmond, perhaps, was curious enough to peep between. So that is the scene that these newcomers are entering into. It's not entirely a friendly, open arms situation. And remember, this is during a time of war, so people have a lot in their minds, tensions are running pretty high. Now, even amongst the wealthier, kind of ruling class of Richmond during the war, um, the incoming tide of, again, wealthy, respectable individuals to the city, this is unsettling to them, because Richmond, like most of Virginia, is very proud of its deep ancestral roots. FFBs, First Families of Virginia, a lot of these families trace their roots back to the first families. And then they see these newcomers coming up from the deep south and from sometimes the southwest, and they say, wait a minute, we're not comfortable with this. Now, some of these women tend to fit in better than others, and we'll talk about them and kind of their differences in just a little bit. Some of these women had known each other from antebellum days as being politicians' wives in Washington, D.C. They had gone to social events together. They were very familiar with each other. They had been longtime friends. 
But again, the war often confounds some of those friendships, and again, the threats that these women constantly feel to their authority, to their power, will divide some of these women, even in this upper class. Advance slide, please. So, what are we talking about? What exactly is the mold for the respectable, elite, Confederate woman in Richmond? Well, we're talking about several things. We're talking, we're talking about appearance, of course. Respectable dress, respectable mannerisms and appearance. This means a woman was expected to have a relatively thin figure. She was expected to be pale, elegant, but not overdone. She was expected to not dress excessively or act in excessively you know, queenly manner, because again, these things could kind of blur the boundaries between a social pretender, as they called them, somebody who wanted to fit in with upper class and who was actually from a very low uh, element of society, as well as the people who actually belonged in the upper ech echelons. We're also talking about piety. So, these women were expected to attend church regularly. They were expected to practice the preachings of the Bible in their daily lives. They're expected to be passive in political conversations. They're not supposed to interject their personal opinions. They're not supposed to disagree, uh, especially with men. They're supposed to be charitable individuals. And by this I mean we're not just talking about nursing. In fact, uh, many of you might know because you're probably well read on the Civil War, nursing was not considered a feminine profession starting with the Civil War. It only kind of transforms into that over the course of the war and still there are some bumps that people have to work out. So the kind of charity that these women are engaging in is charity that's kind of hands off. It's very facade driven. It means not getting your hands too dirty, not doing unseemly things like bathing naked, wounded, uh, bleeding men, but it's doing something that's very kind of performative. These women are also supposed to be excellent social hostesses. They're supposed to be patriotic. They're supposed to be inclusive of these other you know, upper echelon women, but they're also supposed to keep the boundaries very well drawn between themselves and some of the lower classes. And they're supposed to associate with the right people. If you were caught in public associating with the wrong people, and we'll talk more about them in just a minute, this could be kind of the kiss of death for your reputation. This, of course, also means you're supposed to frequent certain spaces in the city, usually those more, you know, those areas on the high ground of the city, the places that were, you know, filled with moral education, entertainment, respectable individuals. You weren't supposed to be necessarily associating with individuals and spaces along, say, the riverfront uh, much of the time. And finally, of course, those familial roots. These women had to be of Southern heritage. They had to have deep, deep roots in uh, the Southern past. Uh, that of course gave them a more respectable reputation. Now some of these women, as I said, some of these elite women, they find it much harder to fit in to this society as kind of the kingpins of Richmond's female elite begin to emerge at the start of the war. And we'll talk more about that in depth as we go along. Now it's important to remember that while I'm talking about the elite class of Richmond, just like today, there is no monolithic group of individuals, right? So these women were not expected to be all the same, at least by our standards, they weren't all the same. We're talking about very different women, very different experiences. Um, we're not talking about one class that shares all of the same ideas or experiences. Advance. All right, so who exactly are these leading ladies? Um, advance one more. All right, so this woman probably looks familiar to many of you. Who is she? Yeah. Mary Chestnut, that's right. She's one of the most famous oh, really? diarists of the war. Yeah, this is one image of her, at least. She is 40 years old at the start of the war. She is from South Carolina. She is the wife of a former U.S. <coughs> senator named James Chestnut. So she was in Washington, D.C. before the war with a lot of these uh, other women that we're going to be talking about. Her husband served briefly as a general in the Confederate Army before realizing that his talents were best used on the home front, and he becomes a private aide to President Jefferson Davis. Mary Chestnut, of course, leaves behind the famous diary for Dixie, which she writes during the war. Uh, she revises it in the 1880s. It's finally published in 1905 and then heavily annotated by C. Van Woodward uh, and others uh, in later years. But it is one of the best accounts of social life in Richmond for these kinds of ladies. Advance, please. Another perhaps famous face, anybody? Uh, <coughs> you probably kick yourself once I say it. <laughs> it's LaSalle Corbell Pickett. 
So this is the third wife of General George Pickett, of course, of Gettysburg fame. She is only 18 years old when the war starts. Um, she's from Nansemond County, Virginia, so she's kind of a refugee coming to the city. Um, she writes two very famous memoirs uh, in the years after the war. She's a big proponent and um, kind of advocate of what we would call the lost cause interpretation of the war. She certainly has very romantic portrayals of the South and, of course, her husband um, and ideas that, you know, he could have done no wrong uh, during the Civil War. Uh, advance, please. This individual might be a little uh, less known to some of you. This is Virginia Clay. Uh, she is 37 from North Carolina at the start of the war, although she does eventually make her way up from Alabama. Um, so again, kind of another refugee, but she is also the wife of a Confederate senator named Clement C. Clay. She also leaves behind a, a pretty rich and, and telling memoir about her wartime experiences. This young lady, anybody for her? Do you know if anybody knows her? She's also perhaps a little less known, but she also leaves a tremendous account about the war. Her name is Constance Carey. Uh, if you guys have been to Richmond, you've seen Carey Street, you know of Carey Town. This is the family. The Carey family was heavily respected, very high echelon society during the war. Um, Constance, like LaSalle Corbell, was 18 when the war started. She's initially from Mississippi, then she moves up to Maryland, then she refugees to Richmond with her cousins. Uh, the Carey family, and she is part of what is called the Carey In Invincibles, the Carey Invincibles, a trio of three young belles in Richmond who are considered basically the most beautiful, the most refined, the most respectable young women in the city. Uh, she leaves behind an excellent memoir. She'll eventually marry uh, Burton Harrison, uh, who is uh, the private secretary to Jefferson Davis throughout uh, much of the war. Can continue? And then this uh, individual, uh, this is Hetty Carey. Uh, she is the cousin of Constance. She is 25 years old at the start of the war, and she is considered the creme de la creme of Richmond society. She is the most beautiful belle. She is the most uh, refined, most respectable, young, up-and-coming coming woman in the city. Um, there's a very famous wedding that takes place in January of 1865 between Hetty Carey and General John Pegram in uh, St. Paul's Church, which is known as the Church of the Confederacy because so many of these politicians and generals and their families worship there. Unfortunately, two weeks later, uh, they all return to the church for a funeral uh, for John Pegram, who was killed outside the Battle of Hatcher's Run uh, not long after their wedding. But Hetty Carey is very much respected by these other elite which, uh, Richmond women. And as one of them will say in their memoir, quote, she was as fearless as she was beautiful, possessing, quote, a rare beauty, perfect as if from a sculptor's chisel, with great poise, round arms, intelligence, and pure wit. Not only did Hetty Carey always dress the part of the city's leading belle, her manners and grace were impeccable. Constance Carey observed that she was, quote, always straightforward, humble, generous, and good-mannered. So Hetty Carey, again, not one of the individuals that most people know about, um, but definitely one of the, uh, the women in the spotlight uh, for Richmond uh, elegant elite society. Uh, you can advance. I really wish that I had an image of this woman, uh, Martha Stannard, but I have not found one to date. If anybody has ever found one, please do let me know. I would love to know what she looked like. Um, but she lived um, on 8th Street in Richmond, up near where the uh, current Virginia Supreme Court stands. So a very you know, ele elegant, elevated part of society. This is where the well-to-do people, of course, live. Um, Martha is from Louisville, Kentucky. She's a wealthy widow. So she's a widow before the war even begins. And she's really a shaper and a creator of this elite class of women. Constance Carey Harrison basically salivates over this woman in her, uh, her memoir. And she says, quote, we all fancied that she came nearer to realizing the French ideal of a salon than any other hostess in Richmond. She was a widow, reputed wealthy, and of considerable personal distinction, handsome, dark-eyed, wondrously persuasive with the other sex, who came when she called and left promptly when she gave them a token change of mood. As you might imagine, it's only the most select members of Richmond society who gain entrance to Martha Stannard's parlor. She hosts a number of lavish receptions throughout the war. It does not matter if it was 1861 
or the eve of the fall of Richmond in 1865. Martha Sayer was hosting these receptions and you wanted to be invited if you were anybody who was anybody. She had distinguished friends, she traveled the world, she would basically relate her world experiences to these individuals, male and female. Her receptions were a collection of what was called the most brilliant and brainiest acquaintances, even though, quite interestingly, Martha Stannard boasted that she had never read a book. Hmm. So I guess all of her intellect came from her personal experiences. Um, she was known to have basically a magnetic personality. Again, if you wanted a ticket into the upper echelon of society, you wanted an in with Martha Stannard. Constance Carey Harrison, again, refers to uh, this woman saying, all the foreigners in town made speed to attend her evenings. Statesmen and soldiers, old and young, came into the circle of her magnetism. Needless to add, the women of Richmond were not slow in availing themselves of her none too profuse invitations. Now, visits to Mrs. Stannard's often required a new dress throughout the war. And for those of you who know about kind of the logistics of getting material through the blockade during the war, this was not an easy thing. Now, Martha's connections, of course, made this a lot easier for her than it was for most other women, and so she always seemed to have a new dress. Every single big salon that she hosted, she was always impeccably dressed in a new outfit. Now, one day, Constance Carey received one of the coveted tickets to this woman's uh, reception, and uh, she realizes she doesn't have any new dresses, and so she goes to her trunk in her attic, and she basically tears through a bunch of old dresses that she's had. And she says that she, quote, tore off pieces of fawn and brown silk from two venerable dresses in the family repertory. And she creatively sews pieces of these various dresses together, making inked quilling and curly cues on a skirt and bodice, along with some ruffles she had trimmed from another dress. Now, Constance Carey goes through such trouble to make sure that she is well-dressed enough for Martha Standard's uh, tastes, that Martha comes up to her at the reception and says, I love that dress. Can you give me the pattern? Okay, so this is, a, this is a dangerous moment for Constance Carey. She's afraid of being found out a fraud. She doesn't have the money to get a brand new dress. She has basically patchworked this dress together. And so she essentially starts to freak out. She stays up all night trying to hide the different pieces, the different seams that she has sewn this dress together with. And she is relieved that, quote, in the daylight, all the press pieces, I'm sorry, in the daylight, all the press places, pieced places, washing and iron quillings would not stand revealed. Fortunately for her, she manages to do such a good job of replacing and repairing this dress and hiding that kind of patchwork um, uh, design that she says it was able to pass public inspection and quote the poor dear fraud did come back within the stipulated time. Now Constance Carey while this is kind of a funny story this dilemma this ordeal that she goes through reveals something bigger about Richmond society and that is of course appearance and conformity to the mold are essential. If you stray from it if you're found out to be a fraud that ever important facade that you're presenting to society that's done. Your reputation is over. So these women, again, they're being challenged not only from some of these lower class newcomers that we'll talk about in a bit, but they're being challenged by some of their peers who hold very high standards for them. Can we fast forward? Now, uh, as I mentioned, some women do not quite as successfully fit into this mold as others. And unfortunately, this lady has one of the toughest times in Richmond fitting into elite society. Also, unfortunately for her, she is, of course, who is she? Verena Davis, that's right, the wife of President Jefferson Davis. So all eyes are on her. She's supposed to set the standards for appearance, for dress, for you know mannerisms, for everything. Well, Verena's 35. She comes from Natchez, Mississippi. So she's from the deep south, bordering on kind of southwest. Not exactly the same background as a lot of these Richmond women, Virginia women. She is extremely opinionated when it comes to her conversations with men. She does not back down uh, in relaying her opinions. She was reported as having a raucous laugh. Uh, people complained that her children, and she had several of them in the Confederate White House during the war, were absolutely wild running around in the house and also in the streets of Richmond. Now I have to say, 
I have a two-year-old daughter, whom my husband and I often refer to as the toddler tyrant terrorist. I do not blame Verena Davis one bit for not being able to control her children, but other people certainly did. Another problematic thing about Verena Davis was that she maintained very strong, very close friendships with women from the North, women who remained loyal to the Union, uh, including Lizzie Lee Blair and Minna Blair, the daughter of the Postmaster General uh, for the Union. This is, of course, sets off numerous suspicions about her throughout the war. She also had her severe doubts about the Confederacy, that secession was even right to begin with, that the Confederacy could succeed, no pun intended, in the end that the Confederacy would win the war. She had doubts about her husband's ability to be a leader, and she voiced these doubts, not necessarily to the general public, but to some friends who began to leak out her doubts. And of course, this made people very suspicious. Yeah. How long was she married to Jefferson Davis before the war started? Oh gosh, when was she married? Um, I want to say at least 10 years, maybe longer than that. She, also, she appears to have an American Indian ancestry by her parents. Um, that's, that's a good point, and I'm getting to that in just a second. Okay. Um, so she has these concerns about the Confederacy. She doubts her husband's ability to be a leader. Um, she's considered emotional, um, kind of unseemly emotional. She has these outbursts, kind of like Mary Lincoln did actually during the war. She was educated as a young girl in Philadelphia. She had ancestry dating back to a Revolutionary War governor of New Jersey. So again, we're talking about these deep ancestral roots. She doesn't match up in the ways uh, that we need her to match up. Um, she was considered of larger size than most of the women in her class, although I don't think she was necessarily fat by her standards, but she was bigger. And sometimes she wore what was called excessive jewelry that uh, caused some of her critics to label her the Lady Queen. A lot of people were convinced that she influenced her husband unnecessarily based upon her personal relationships with the wives of generals and politicians that Jefferson Davis interacted with. One day everything would be great between Davis and some of these generals. Joe Johnston uh, is one of them. The next day after a big fight between Joe Johnston's wife and Verena, there was a big fight between Jefferson Davis and Joe Johnston. So people were concerned about how opinionated she was and how bossy she was with her husband. Now, getting to the point that you raised. A lot of these women referred to her as, quote, a coarse Western belle, and that was, of course, not only because of her mannerisms um, and her behavior, but also the way that she looked. And some people even started to make what we would call racial slurs about her. Uh, Lydia Johnston, wife of Joe Johnston, uh, and Charlotte Wigfall, who was the wife of a Texas senator, referred to her as, quote, a squaw, again referring to her skin tone. Uh, skin tone. They said that she had a wild personality, and Marion Myers, who was the wife of the uh, Confederate Quartermaster General, uh, criticized her, quote, nearly mulatto skin. She was overly commanding, too tall, and masculine. Now, okay, we're talking about 19th century, 1860s Richmond. If you're an elite lady, the last thing you want to be accused of is having skin that looked too dark to be pure Anglo-Saxon blood. And people suspected this of Verena throughout the war. So this is kind of an early kiss of death, just simply by the way that she looked, the tone of her skin. We'll get back to her in just a minute. Can you pass for her? Does anybody know this lady? Yeah. We are part of a group that uh, has a very limited time here. I've enjoyed very much, but I, I, I didn't want to interrupt you. So oh, yeah. we would like some of that. Oh, no, that's fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for coming. I appreciate yeah. you spending some of your limited time here. <laughs> Sorry for being the first No, that's okay. I understand. Thank you. Um, so this lady is a woman named Phoebe Pember. And uh, for those of you who have been to Richmond, uh, you might be somewhat familiar with her story. She is the chief matron at Chimborazo Hospital, which is the largest Confederate hospital uh, during the entire Civil War, located on the eastern outskirts of the city. Now, Phoebe is 38 at the start of the war. She comes from Charleston, South Carolina, but she's basically the epitome of the aristocrat turned matron. She leaves her pretensions to elite identity at home when she arrives for her job as matron at Chimborazo. She basically converts her ideas of respectable ladyship to one that will work in the practical realities of the war. 
She knows that she needs to get her hands dirty. She doesn't subscribe to the belief that it's unseemly for a woman to be around bleeding half-naked men, to have to bathe them, to have to do on all, all sorts of uh, kind of not necessarily feminine um, activities with them. She believes that the war demanded this of women and that the new identity for an elite woman should be one of caretaker. She feared that Spartan austerity was, quote, lacking in the city during the war, and she thought that the writing on the wall uh, was already there in place for a Confederate defeat by about midway through the war. So she's not too um, happy with some of these women who are revelers and partiers throughout the war. Fast forward. This woman um, also left behind an excellent memoir that's published um, that anybody can read today. Her name is Judith McGuire. She's older, obviously. She's 58 at the start of the war. Now, she's a native of Richmond. Her roots go deep, unlike someone like Verena Davis. Um, her blood goes back to Brockenbro blood, which if any of you, of you are familiar with Richmond society, you've heard that name. It's a very distinguished name in, in uh, Richmond. Um, her husband is a minister. He later works in the uh, Confederate Post Office Department. Um, Judith McGuire basically kind of has the unfortunate fall from grace during the war. She's from this distinguished family. She comes from money, but due to various circumstances, she loses that money. She is forced to leave her Richmond home, move to Ashland, which is a uh, town just north of Richmond. Eventually, she's forced to come back to Richmond, and uh, what is kind of the icing on the cake for her is that she is forced to live in the old Brock and Brow family mansion, again, once considered the most distinguished homes in all of Richmond, but she is forced to share the ballroom of the mansion with seven other families. So imagine what a slap in the face this is to Judith McGuire. Now, she longs to still be part of this upper sect of society, the ones who basically rule the social and political scene at home. But she realizes as she is increasingly alienated from that society, she's unwanted because of her fall from grace, how selfish and materialistic these women seem to her. And she often comments walking by some of their homes late at night, seeing the candlelights you know, in the windows, seeing their, them illuminated, having some of these lavish receptions and they refuse to basically give her the time of day. And uh, she comments on how overindulgent this kind of behavior seems. So she gets to be one of the greatest critics of these ladies, even though she comes from their class. Now, Judith McGuire isn't the only critic, critic of these women. The ladies were often critiqued by their own husbands. Um, James Chestnut, the husband of Mary Chestnut, um, Confederate senator, uh, he called Mary, quote, hospitality gone mad because he believed she was way too into the party scene during a time of war. There are newspapers, the Richmond Times Dispatch, our Daily Dispatch, as it was called back then, the Southern Punch, a, a satiric, satirical newspaper, was often very vocal about the inappropriate excesses that these women uh, participated in. And also these women were critiqued as well by some of the poorer members of society, although it's hard to get their voices in the 21st century, uh, as well as some of the more sober-minded middling classes of society. So these women are also severely critiqued by soldiers and by generals and by officers in the Confederate Army. This is native Richmonder Willie Pegram. Willie Pegram serves in the um, Confederate artillery he is eventually killed uh, later in the war, but before he is, he writes that Richmond is getting, quote, fearfully corrupt. And he and other soldiers, even General Lee himself, commented that they were concerned that God would punish the Confederacy if this kind of excess, this indulgent behavior, continued from the upper classes. So there are calls for revivals, as some of you might know, um, for the Confederate Army in the fall of 1863 and early 1864, but those calls for revivals also spread to the home front. And so we see churches trying to reach out and say, hey, we need to curb the morals of society here. We're not only being threatened from below uh, and from the morals that you know we don't tolerate at all from the lower elements of society, but we're also being threatened by this excess, this indulgence uh, from above. Do you want to advance, please? So how did these ladies respond to all this critique? Some of them wrote back very fiery to their husbands. Mary Chestnut tried to stage some of her parties when her husband was conveniently out of town. Sometimes that backfired when he came home early and found her involved in this lavish party uh, in her parlor. 
but these women justify this indulgence. And I think this is where we have to kind of step back and look at these women through 19th century eyes. It's easy to look back at them now and say, what were they thinking? They were so selfish, they were so indulgent. Granted, they might have been, and definitely were in certain ways, but this is how they justified it to themselves, and this is what we have to understand, even if we don't agree with it. Mary Chestnut sulks in her diary in 1864, quote, hope and fear are both gone. It is distraction or death with us. I don't see how sadness or despondence could help us. Now remember, these women, because many of their husbands are either away on the battlefields, they're preoccupied with political matters, they are charged with enormous responsibility for helping to keep Richmond society together. They feel like if they are too despondent, if they are robbed of some of that privilege that identifies them as social and political leaders, the jig is up. What does the Confederacy mean if this very carefully ordered social hierarchy basically crumbles around their fingertips? This is why they see it so important to maintain this elite identity and to garner this basically deference from lower society to rule. Now, LaSalle Corbell Pickett was never one for really mincing words. She said, perhaps a little more flippantly, quote, how could we live on the rim of a volcano if we could not dance around its crater? That was her response. So despite these tensions uh, within the upper class, uh, the ladies knew that they had to stick together. They knew that they were being critiqued, but they knew it was essential for them to portray a united front uh, against these threats from below that we're about to talk about. They need to, needed to show a strong, unified class that had solidarity with their peers, that had solidarity before others who might question their fitness to rule. Um, they had to basically project the power and the confidence that they needed uh, to keep the war going on the home front. They also had to make sure that they could prevent any kind of usurpation by these social pretenders, these newcomers from within. And these newcomers come from various classes and various elements of society, but these ladies are constantly worried about their social position. They are constantly worried about a rebellion occurring. And of course, these rebellions could mean different things depending upon who would engage in them. So where do these women see these threats to their social and political power coming from? One area is the immigrant population and the factory workers in Richmond. Now these are the individuals who work in, again, those kind of low-lying geographical areas of Richmond along the riverfront by the factories. A lot of them are Irish. And of course, in the 19th century, there was no great love uh, for Irish people um, in the South or in the North. There was a part of the eastern edge of the city called Shaco Bottom, which some of these women uh, and their husbands named Little Dublin because of the proliferation of Irish families. There are also fears of excessive drinking and gambling and crime in these areas, and there certainly were a large number of instances of that during the war for different reasons. There's also, of course, the constant fear of rebellion from slaves and free African Americans. When your husbands are away from you, when your husbands are otherwise preoccupied, what is one of the number one things that Southern women will write about during the war? Fears of a slave rebellion. And they've seen it happen before. Nat Turner's rebellion in 1831, Gabriel's rebellion in the early 19th century. Some of these rebellions were thwarted, but this is always on their minds. They have to try to keep these people at bay in their minds. They are constantly reading the newspapers in which the mayor's court items are reported of theft, of arson, of running away, of insolent behavior by slaves and by free blacks in the city. Uh, respectable white women are being jostled off of the city's sidewalks by free African American women. One of the most horrifying things to Mary Chestnut is that at one low point in her life during the war, I believe it was 1864, she was running low on money. If that's you know, hard to believe for someone of her class, but she was, and it did happen for some of these women. So she goes to sell some of her older dresses and finery in basically a secondhand shop. And she turns around after making the transaction, and who does she see right next to her, rifling through the very clothes that she has just deposited? A free black woman. Now again, think about policing those boundaries, those social boundaries. 
If free black women are somehow able to have the money to buy any kind of these baubles of respectability, this is considered a huge slap in the face, a huge threat to these white women. It's considered mockery, quite frankly. And in fact, the city actually institutes a rule about canes being used by black men on the city sidewalk um, for a number of reasons, but one of them is definitely having pretensions to respectability that black men, of course, were not expected to have back then. These women were also writing about how scared they were that African Americans were gathering in secret parties, they were drinking, they were dancing, they were potentially plotting rebellion, and so there are different ordinances that are put out throughout the war about how many uh, African Americans could be in one space at a single time without necessarily a, a chaperone, uh, kind of making sure that everything was okay. They were also concerned that these African Americans were, quote, infesting the places that had been traditionally the playground of the elite. Capitol Square is one of them. The theater is another one. Some of the churches, churches where, quote, rowdy weddings would take place with African American participants. This horrified these white women, and again, they felt like their spatial boundaries were being somehow taken away from them, were being transgressed. I think. All right, here we go, to the juicy stuff. Then we have the women from the world's oldest profession. The prostitutes, they come on basically the first train load of people coming to Richmond in May of 1861, once the capital is set up there. Why do they come? Business is good, right? We have all these soldiers coming into the city, they're recuperating, they're in hospitals. We have these men, single men, away from their families who are coming to take government jobs, to work in offices relating to the Confederate government. Now, some of these women are lifelong prostitutes. It's their profession basically out of need from a time when they are um, shockingly very young. Others, however, see that the war has created opportunity, and some things never change in that regard. Um, some people see there's an opportunity here to make really a good living off of prostitution. And um, in fact, on East Cary Street, again, for those of you familiar with Richmond, there were a number of uh, bordellos that were quite successful during the time of the Civil War. Some of these women accumulated astonishing amounts of personal and real estate throughout the war. Advance. There were other more lowly brothels, however, in Richmond, usually on the lower eastern edges of the city, again along the waterfront. These were some of the uh, brothels that housed the more desperate women. Um, some of these brothels eventually made their way up very close, disturbingly close to these women, uh, to Capitol Square, which of course was the playground uh, of the elite. And in fact, uh, it was reported that, quote, an enterprising madam opened her brothel with women disporting themselves in all sorts of undress in day and night, right by the Capitol itself and across from the YMCA where there are, of course, recuperating Confederate soldiers. There was also a very lowly brothel called The Stable by what was then known as Wall Street. It's basically where I-95 currently cuts through the eastern edge of Richmond. And in the newspaper, it is reported at The Stable that, quote, it was a large new brick house containing at least a dozen rooms which are rented out separately. It has always been tenanted by persons of the lowest character and of the most destitute description. More thieves and burglars have had their local habitation in it and been captured under this roof than in any other house of its age in the city. Recently, its inmates, having become peculiarly, peculiarly disagreeable to the neighbors, a complaint was made to the mayor who issued a warrant for the arrest of every person found in it. And when that warrant is executed, they find 14 women inside, as well as three men. Ten of those women were under the age of 10, which is shocking but they were, quote, labeled, of the vilest character, the dirtiest person, and the most brazen faces. It was called the most disorderly house in town by one witness, women who exposed their naked selves in the day in the windows and hallooed, spat upon passers-by when the sun went down, arrived at the time for the exercise of their most disagreeable practices. They got drunk and made the night hideous with the maudlin rever reverie, which was varied by fights and shrieks and cries of murder. So again, this is deeply, deeply troubling and deeply unsettling to these women and other elite members of society. And these different brothels and red light districts essentially spread out along the eastern edge of the city, which is what you can see here 
uh, in this photo. Now, why are prostitutes so concerning? Yes, it's the low morals that they bring to society, but it's also kind of their confounding or mocking of elite respectability. They are jostling respectable women off the sidewalks. They are taking the carriages and the hacks away from women who need them to go to, you know, elegant um, receptions and things like uh, Martha Stannard was uh, hosting. They were wearing excessive jewels and sporting low-cut dresses that people were afraid would confuse young women, thinking, well, that's what it means to be a young lady. That's what it means to be a refined lady, is to wear all these jewels and you know, excessive finery. But people were also afraid that these prostitutes were emasculating Confederate men. They were tempting them to steer away from their duties on the battlefield or in government offices, and emasculating them by appealing, of course, to um, their sexual desires. It was reported that some of these prostitutes actually appeared outside Libby Prison, which was one of the most famous prisons of the war in the eastern end of Richmond, and were basically calling to these men, you know, break out, come find me, I'm located here and here on this corner of these streets. So again, this is a very real threat uh, to these women. In one point, some of these women actually make it to one of the big theaters in town during a performance, um, I think it was a Shakespeare play actually, and the show is literally stopped halfway through, and the newspaper uh, writes that a soiled dove had been found in one of the theater's most upper boxes. The show was stopped, and the theater had to be fumigated, perhaps metaphorically. But again, the vice that's infesting these elite areas. Want to continue? Now, one of the huge threats uh, to these Richmond women is a major rebellion of sorts, a riot that happens in April of 1863 called the Richmond Bread Riots. Um, this riot is comprised of about 300 women from, most of them from the lower classes of society, though not all of them. It's led by a woman named Mary Jackson. She's the wife of a sign painter. Her son is in the army. And she rallies these women together. They meet at Capitol Square, and they proceed to march down through town with signs around their necks that say, bread or blood. And some of them carry hatchets. Some of them carry knives. They're behaving in a very unfeminine, kind of disorderly uh, manner and they are demanding bread. What's interesting is that when some of the items captured by these women were closely investigated, most of the items were not in fact foodstuffs. There were shoes, there were books, there were jewelry, and what does that tell us about what these women were trying to accomplish? Some of them were genuinely hungry, but some of them were just plain angry. They were being denied those baubles of respectability that these elite women had enjoyed for themselves throughout the war. They felt unprotected by these women, unprotected by the Confederate government, who had taken their husbands, their sons, sent them into the army with promises to protect them, and basically given them a life that they felt was unladylike. Now, of course, women of Richmond from elite classes, they try to suppress the news of these riots. They don't want news getting out that the Capitol is basically going to hell in a, uh, or basically, you know, just crumbling around their fingers. And so they try to dismiss what these women were, who they were. Oh, they were Yankees who were sent down here from the north. Oh, they were foreigners. They were Germans. They were Irish. Oh, they were prostitutes. They were all different kinds of people. They weren't Southerners. They weren't true women. They called these women masculine. They called them raw-toothed and jaw-boned. Um, all kinds of different things, basically, to deny their femininity. No true Southern woman could possibly have a beef with elite society in Richmond. And so these women constantly have this fear. Their authority is crumbling around them. Their political power is falling apart. The social order is falling apart. Spatial boundaries are being blurred. And if all that falls apart, then what is a Confederate victory for in the end, right? Mm. If their society as they know it falls to pieces. And so these women have a solution. Continue. They begin to engage in what I call a series of rituals or carefully crafted social performances in which the streets, the houses, public buildings of Richmond become the stages for these women to showcase their right to authority and to power. Some of these rituals are traditional. They have exercised them before the war, and some of them are kind of tweaked or amped up by the war. And these include a variety of, of different things that the women engage on, almost on a daily basis with some of them. There are parlor parties and charades and tableau vivant, which is where they recreate famous paintings. You know, again, displaying, we know, you know, these very upper class uh, kind of elements of society, and we have a right to participate in these engagements. 
promenading on Capitol Square, again showcasing we're the true women of Richmond society, so don't forget it, it's not those prostitutes, by attending select theaters that engage in educational, morally uplifting uh, performances. You don't want to be caught seeing the varieties or maudlin type theater, or else, of course, you're going to be accused of supporting that kind of entertainment. They're also engaging in specific kinds of charity, where they're trying to showcase to society, see, we can take care of you, we have a right to be your leaders, but we're going to make sure we don't get our hands dirty because that's your job. Mm -hmm. So again, a lot of the nurses who go into the hospitals, they're from the middling, if not upper, end of the lower classes of society. What these women are doing is driving their horses and carriages to the doors of those hospitals, dropping off overflowing baskets of wine and ham hocks and cakes and all kinds of elaborate things, waving to make sure everybody knows, hey, we were here, we dropped off all these goodies, and then driving back to their houses. So a very performative act. They also engage in what I think is one of the more interesting charitable activities of the war, where some of these women create what is called the Ladies' Gunboat Association, and they decide that they're going to run a call for scraps of iron, scraps of metal, taking in any kinds of metal pieces that these women can collect throughout Virginia as well as North Carolina, some of the neighboring states' countrysides, and they will transform those scraps into a Confederate gunboat to operate in the Confederate Navy. You think it's crazy, but they actually accomplished it. The CSS Richmond eventually set sail, and these women were quite proud of themselves. Now, of course, they made sure to publicize that they were the ones who created this gunboat um, and that they were, of course, these very charitable individuals. Can you click forward? Church going was also seen as an integral social performance or ritual. Of course, these women were deeply pious. They believed in what they were doing, going to church, just as many of them did with, you know, donating money and, and food to charity. But also church was a place to be seen. The seating was set off by hierarchical seating, so the pe people who came from the higher elements of society would sit in the front of the church, and then the lesser people would sit in the middle, and then so forth and so on, all the way up to the back, where, of course, the lowest people of society would be. One young woman said that she couldn't concentrate in church because of the proliferation of fancy hats that she was staring at during the service. So this is obviously a congregation point for these women and a performance. And of course, we have these very famous wartime weddings, which are patriotic events as well as weddings. There are holiday events that take place. Christmas events are a big deal for these women. They combine charity with the promenade, going to church, segregated fancy celebrations. Um, every holiday is, of course, a chance for these women to shine and to perform their power. And perhaps the greatest social performance of all, dance. The starvation party, which doesn't sound like much fun, but this is the ultimate performance to me. Uh, the Starvation Club was created by Constance Carey in Richmond uh, in 1863, and it was declared that, quote, no food or beverage would be served except the amber-hued water of the James River. Doesn't that sound delightful? <laughs> Only amateur entertainment would be allowed. Some of these women claimed that they showed up to these uh, dances and these parties dressed only in homespun. When you really read closely into their memoirs, most of their, them are coming in pretty nicely, you know, orchestrated outfits. So this, to me, is the perfect example of these women trying to say to society, look, we're suffering like you, we're sacrificing like you, we understand how bad this war is for you, and we are willingly denying ourselves the things that we are used to. But by coming dressed to the nines and making sure everybody sees them on their way to these parties, they're saying, just in case you forgot, we're, we're still on top. We're still in power. Fast forward. So what can we make of all of this that I've talked to you about this afternoon? All of these performances, all of these rituals that these women engage in, they are carefully crafted. They do mean many different things to these women and the people who receive them. They're meant to, number one, separate and distinguish the high women of society from the lower elements of society. Number two, they're meant to reinforce the morals and respectability and the good behavior of the leaders of the Confederate capital. Number three, they're needed, as LaSalle Corbell Pickett and Mary Chestnut reminded us, to bolster the morale of the ruling class and support these social and political foundations that the Confederacy is based upon. And finally, they're meant to 
try to gain the approval, garner the deference of the lower classes of society, proving these women are worth listening to. They are worthy leaders, they are worthy of power and authority. Now this didn't always work, of course, for these women, and if you look at the newspapers throughout the war, you will see that crime and vice grows worse and worse, prostitution increases, spaces are being co-opted uh, by the lower elements of society, gambling and drinking continues, in fact increases over the course of the war, there is more arson, there is more theft by slaves, uh, and so there are these confounding challenges to the Confederate social order that are just untamable. Now, in several instances, unfortunately for these women, they become basically the laughing stock of Richmond society, of newspaper editors, of soldiers, of these lower classes, because they look completely detached from reality, especially with these starvation parties. I mean, some of these people are thinking, how patronizing that you're you know, engaging in this performance and you expect us to buy it. And so they're just tied to these rituals, and they become more and more forcefully tied to them and they look like hollow actors, basically, by the end of the war, performing these, these rituals um, in a way that's quite alienating to those around them. So ultimately, the ladies don't fully realize or want to admit to themselves that they are losing control. They're becoming estranged from those whose deference they so desperately need, and they are losing ground. So in their attempt to rout out these social pretenders that they're so scared of, they're actually becoming some of the greatest social pretenders of all. So to conclude, how did these women make sense of what happened to them over the course of the war? These women who had relied on these performances, these rituals, this very strict social hierarchy throughout four years and more, it all comes crashing down on them in April of 1865. This is Richmond after um, the burning of Richmond in early April. After Richmond falls, the ladies have to come to terms with their new world and the reorganization of society that they tried so hard to keep together but had really failed to preserve. And that wasn't just their fault by any means. There are internal factors, there are external factors. Now I mentioned that many of these women leave excellent diaries and memoirs about their experiences. They in fact begin to find refuge and comfort in their writings about the war and the post-war period. And so after the war, many of them take to their diaries. They revise them so many times. They publish them, trying to reconstruct their world in the Confederate capital, not only as they wanted to remember it, but how they wanted others to remember it as well. And so according to one of these women, Sally Putnam, she writes, quote, with memories crowding like trooping phantoms, some beautiful and pleasant, some taunting and derisive, the fingers of the leading ladies toyed listlessly with a key. For these women, quote, the past was somewhat tarnished, but the red stains are partially worn off by recent use. What must be done with it? Regardless of the stains and tarnishing from time, Sally Putnam said, we feel that there is something in the locked chamber that will interest us, something that the world would be wiser and better for knowing. And so these women, quote, turned the key to reveal the secrets held by the Confederate capital during four years of terrible civil war. Through the publishing of these various diaries and wartime memoirs, Richmond's former ladies did indeed extend light into this world, the world that they knew during the war. And their memoirs have in large part create, created our understandings and sometimes misunderstandings um, of what the Civil War was like in Richmond. Now Putnam hoped that, quote, the rising generation forget not her ancient prestige, that they plead for still greater light, they call for an increase of educational resources. Now, for any of you who have read some of these primary sources, any primary sources pertaining to the Civil War, particularly those pertaining to the South, these memoirs, these diaries, can be heavily tinged with a rosy nostalgia. Everything was great, we were all united, we never had fights with each other, African Americans were completely pleased with their situation, slavery was good for them, et cetera, et cetera. So we need careful mining of these sources to try and figure out, okay, what's, what's the real story? We have to look between the lines. And I think we can accomplish that. I think we can understand if we look closely. So these writings today provide us valuable insights, not only into the world that these women experienced, the world that they lived in, also the world that their not-so-ladylike peers inhabited. It also tells us about kind of the power struggle between these upper-class ladies in the lower class elements of society as they struggle for that social and political authority throughout the war. But there's something else that these writings tell us, something I want 
you all to leave here today thinking about. They reveal how Richmond's leading ladies perceived and wanted to remember their former life in the Confederate capital. Whether it was actually like what they are writing or not, this is how they believed it was, and this is how they wanted us to believe it was. They knew what was at stake if they did not portray it in a certain way. Indeed, their entire social and political identity as they knew it, their way of life, and their personal identity. So, to conclude, in reality, these perceptions, these memories, however tinged or flawed they might be, were as real and as valuable to these women and to us, looking back at them 150 years later, trying to make sense of them and what these women were thinking, as anything that these women actually lived. Thank you. Yeah.